Okay, good morning again, everyone. Uh, today, uh, we are going to talk about rasterization, uh, which is the problem of drawing primitives on a discretized image, uh, basically. Uh, so, uh, this is what you will also be implementing in your second assignment. Uh, so, let me quickly uh, recap what you're going to do. I mean, if you, if you haven't uh, already read the second assignment description, let me just quickly describe uh, what you're going to do. Uh, the input will be similar to the ray tracing assignment. You will be given a virtual scene, uh, some meshes, uh, uh, with word, vertex information. Uh, one other thing that you will be given in this, uh, an additional thing that you will be given in the scene description file will be a set of a sequence of modeling transformations that will be applied on these individual meshes like rotation, translation, scaling. They will also be indicated with the mesh information. So the first thing you'll do is just apply I mean, maintain a 4x4 four four matrix for each mesh, uh, which, uh, which, is, uh, which is used to compose these modeling transformations, camera transformations, the, the camera parameters will also be given, and the projection transformations. So you'll just use the, the matrices, how we form them uh, in these viewing transformation slides. And uh, at the end, you will get the final pixel coordinates of each individual, for example. Just uh, for, when you start doing the assignment, uh, instead of trying to work on uh, starting directly on a complicated scene, for example, start with a single triangle. How you would, uh, if you can solve a single triangle, uh, you would be able to uh, solve, I mean, yeah, it's not, uh, you'll be using the same code to, uh, render all of the triangles of these meshes. So now what we will do, focusing on a single triangle, uh, you just apply these transformations, uh, modeling, viewing, and projection transformations, and viewport transformations to each of the vertices of the triangle, which will give you some pixel coordinates for uh, these triangle vertices. If back face, ba if backface culling is enabled, also you're go going to implement backface culling, which is very simple. Just you're going to look at the normal. Each triangle will have a front face, which will be indicated by the counterclockwise order of its vertices. So you will just you may pre-compute for each uh, triangle its normal vector, and uh, and you're going to find whether the direction from the eye point to one of the vertices of the vector, which is which will be your view vector, dot product between this normal and uh, your view vector uh, is uh, negative or positive. If it's negative, you'll, uh, the front face is uh, facing you, so you're going to render it. Otherwise, you're just going to ignore that triangle. That's, that's the back face culling, basically. Um, ignoring that the cl clipping, uh, you're just going to implement clipping only for line segments, which are triangles edges. So there will be two modes of rendering, um, solid mode and wireframe mode. In wireframe mode, we, our triangles will just be three line segments. Uh, the inside of the triangle is not going to be rendered uh, in the assignment. So uh, for those who have just recently joined, I, I'm just summarizing what you'll be doing in the assignment. So in the wireframe mode, there will be lines uh, for lines that are outside the clipping uh, canonical view volume. You are going to implement uh, one of the clipping algorithms of your choice, uh, and after that point, you are going to do rasterization. So the problem we will at that point be, if for example, if again I'm focusing on a single triangle, uh, we are going to have or a single line. For example, one primitive is a line, another primitive is a triangle. If you're going to render a scene that is like this, uh, we, are, we are going to be, after this point, we are going to be working, after viewport transformation, we will be working on a discretized image with pixels on it. But the rest will be how to draw uh, these triangles. Will, which pixels are going to be highlighted if you're going to draw this triangle? 
uh, and image pixels are going to be highlighted if you're going to draw this line. So today we are going to see this, how we can interpolate if the colors, color information on the vertices or color information at the endpoints are also provided, how we can interpolate smoothly along the surface of the triangle or along the line segment. Uh, today we are going to talk about these problems and we are going to see some efficient algorithms uh, to do those. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah you, what you're going to do, so, uh, Said asks a question. Uh, you're, going to, you're not going to implement polygon clipping, you're going to implement line clipping only. As you uh, stated, line clipping is more suitable. We don't want you to implement polygon clipping. Uh, you're going to do line clipping for the three edges. It's going to be only available for, uh, I mean, line clipping will only be implemented in the wireframe mode. And therefore, in wireframe mode, your triangles will not be nothing but three edges, three line segments. So you're just going to render a bunch of lines on the, on the screen. And uh, therefore, uh, you're, you'll be implementing line clipping. Only, only line clipping, not polygon clipping. I hope this answers your question. Uh, and also uh, in the assignment outputs, so this is what's being shared with you, some input outputs. Some outputs look bad, I mean, uh, because one thing that you're not going to be responsible in this assignment is during rasterization, we usually also take care of how fragments are uh, used to update the pixel. For example, front objects should hide. I mean, if a pixel is closer to the viewer than another pixel, that should be the pixel that should update the pixel value, right? It's the order of rendering, I mean, if you have three triangles, uh, the last triangle you have, uh, you're going to render, I mean, if, if you just think about it like this, if you just, just a paint program, for example, if you're just rendering three triangles, let's, let's do that. For example, this is my uh, black triangle, and then I'm going to draw a red triangle, draw the red triangle, you draw the entirety of the red triangle, and then you say, I'm going to draw the blue triangle, you draw a blue triangle, it's corners, all, the only information you get is this corner sorry, on these pixels, and you draw a blue triangle. What if this the blue triangle actually is the farthest, I mean, in terms of the, according to the weaver, it's, the, uh, it's behind these triangles. Since I draw this last, it's actually, I draw every one of these pixels as blue, but it's actually behind both red and blue black. So actually when you're updating the image pixel values, you cannot just blindly update pixel values for during rasterization because as you can see it's going to cause some problems for objects that are behind. For this there is an algorithm called depth buffer algorithm uh, in which you're not going to implement this in the second assignment. Uh, in, but the algorithm is actually very simple. Uh, it's like this. For every pixel, we also maintain its distance, uh, which we call it z value, actually. Uh, if we know the z values, the depth values of these vertices, z1, z2, z3, uh, the z values, just like we are interpolating color uh, on the triangle, we can interpolate the depth values. And when we are updating a pixel value, we check its depth. Uh, to a previous depth that updated this pixel. So actually, in addition to our image, which contains color, we, we maintain a same resolution image. Okay, I, I don't have space uh, below here, so I drew it like a thin rectangle, but it's, it has the same height. Okay, it's the same image, but this one does not contain color information, but depth information. Uh, so this, such, this array, this matrix is called depth buffer. Uh, or Z buffer sometimes, okay, and uh, it's implemented on the GPU, this Z buffer algorithm. What happens is every time you update a pixel's color value, you also write to the corresponding pixel in the depth buffer the Z value, the depth of the object that updated this one. 
In that sense, you're just maintaining the minimum t, just like in ray tracing. Instead of a for each ray, you were maintaining a single min t for because each ray was uh, for a particular specific pixel. Now imagine this depth buffer is like you have min t values for all everything for all of your pixels in uh, one array in one matrix. That's what this depth buffer is. So just before you update the color value, you just check whether this depth is smaller than the previous depth. Only if it's smaller, you update the depth and you update the color. So this solves that backwards forwards problem. Uh, and again, we are assuming we have all opaque objects. We don't have transparent objects. If we have transparent objects, a depth buffer like this will not be sufficient. We would maybe at every pixel, we would need to uh, store a, a vector of values for all the fragments that contribute to pixel and their transparency values along with their colors should be stored at every pixel value here instead of a single scalar depth. So that's how you can handle transparent things, but we're not going to go into transparent object rendering in this course. So just assume that we have all opaque objects in which uh, when an object is in front of another object, it completely hides the object that's behind. But anyway, so this is, we are going to talk about depth buffering uh, later, but you're not responsible. You're not going to implement depth buffer uh, in this second assignment. Uh, and the ramifications of this not implemented depth buffer is actually, uh, you're going to get some images that doesn't look right. Look at this. Look at the horse's feet. I mean, it doesn't look right. I mean, this is like the, the, the left foot of the horse, which is this one. Let me turn on, annotate. This one, right? I mean, it is the left foot. This is the right foot, which should be in front of the left foot, right? Because it's closer to us. But there is something unnatural going on this part. Uh, because left foot is like this rendered in front of uh, right foot. Uh, so uh, that's the reason of this. Because and, and the only reason is that the triangles, the triangle order of this horse uh, does not take into account where our camera is going to be. It's just an arbitrary order of triangles. So if the left foot triangles happen to come later, then the right foot triangles, they are rendered later, so they are rendered on top of the right foot, so uh, we get some, this unnatural thing that something that is far away is actually uh, overlapping something, I mean, is displayed over uh, something that is closer to us. And the same problem with here, okay? The, the cup looks really bad. I mean, oh, look at all these triangles, because I think there are some random ordering, some of these uh, triangles that are at the back, uh, even if back face culling is on, um, they are even front. They are front faces, which are the inside. Probably there are some dark triangles that are there, uh, which be, which are displayed randomly. I, I mean, the, these artifacts that you see on these images are due to um, not implementing the depth buffer algorithm. Uh, okay, so in the first version of the, I mean, in, like five years ago, in the first version of this assignment that we have given. Uh, we, I actually implemented the depth buffer algorithm and uh, in that one I don't, oh, I don't, I don't have that output I think or oh, oh, maybe I have, yeah, yeah here. Uh, there are still some bugs like this horse's food is like yeah, called some mud or something. I think there's some uh, because this somehow this cube effect that one, but uh, let me, yeah, look at this one. Actually, they should appear like this. Okay, so the cup looks nicely solid, no triangles. I mean, this 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 is the uh, image that we should get if we have the depth buffer algorithm uh, implemented. Uh, but that's okay. I mean, if you can, uh, you're, you can actually add that later after you submit the assignment. Adding the depth buffer is just uh, adding a very small function, maintaining these depths and just checking 
Before updating your pixel, all you need to do is check the depth buffer value for that pixel. If it's smaller, update it. Update the pixel value, color value, and also update the depth value. Otherwise, don't do anything. And also, interpolate just like you're interpolating color along the triangle uh, surface, you need to interpolate the depth value along with them. But this is the same thing as you do with color, you do it with depth, so it's no big deal. Uh, so implementation of the depth buffer algorithm is very trivial actually, but since we, we, we're not going to cover it in time, uh, we didn't put it in uh, assignment 2. So your images will look a little bit weird, uh, your outputs, uh, these are. this is the reason that they look weird. But some of the outputs, uh, they don't look bad, let's see. Uh, for example, calling enabled outputs. Lots of flags here. There's a sample. So, for example, yeah, this one is just a cube with, uh, I think, 12 triangles on it. And each triangle has uh, the, the vertices are assigned colors. So, in this one, you're not going to implement the shading model too. Uh, vertices will be assigned colors automatically. Okay. Uh, yeah, actually, yeah, the depth buffer would be a nice bonus question. Uh, maybe uh, we can think about that, but we don't want to update the assignment. Okay, people may have started on that, but yeah, it could have been a bonus one as well. Yeah, let me let me ask Ozoja to see uh, see what he thinks about this. Uh, but yeah, I mean, actually, it, it, it may be worthwhile to work on that. Just it will like in half an hour, you will probably uh, be able to do that. Uh, I mean, which will turn these bad-looking images. Look at this one. I mean, <laughs> this is this really looks really, the horse is just uh, looks very bad. But yeah, I mean, if if in half an hour work can turn this image into a good one, I think it's worth worthwhile doing that, but let's see how it goes. Anyway, so uh, without further ado, uh, let's uh, start today's rasterization. I will quickly uh, go over, uh, we are first going to see a line drawing algorithm, uh, which is called the midpoint algorithm, which just uses integer operations, integer addition, uh, iteratively, uh, to draw a line uh, between two pixels. So the problem is we are given two pixels, uh, pixel coordinates on an image, and our goal is to draw a line like this. Uh, modern uh, line drawers actually not only uh, draw a binary line like this, what I mean is that when a pixel belongs to a line, uh, it's uh, the color of that line. If the pixel doesn't belong to a line, it's the background color. So we have this turn on, turn off a pixel, a binary decision. But in reality these days, uh, this is in, uh, what is called anti-aliasing. Uh, in order not to have these zigzags visible to uh, human eye, uh, neighboring pixels are also assigned the color something between a, a shade of red, for example, is given. Uh, a lighter red, a combination of red and the background color may be assigned here uh, to uh, to the neighboring pixels, which will make the line appear smoother, okay? But we are not going to, again, do that. Just know that this is called anti-aliasing. Uh, and it is, so this is an S, uh, and it is used in uh, modern uh, line drawing algorithms, but we are just going to draw lines in this binary uh, fashion. So this is our goal. Uh, and without loss of generality, actually, it loses generality, but it's, uh, uh, it's easy to adapt to other cases. We are going to assume that our line uh, has a slope between 0 and 1, okay, which means this. So we are going to be given two endpoints, okay, x1, y1, which is the center of a pixel. Okay, so assume after the viewport transformation, we find the, the, this coordinate, which is an integer coordinate, which indicates the center of a pixel. And we will be given x2, y2. And we are going to assume that, okay, the center, these coordinates, we are going to assume uh, y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1, which is the slope of this line, uh, is... Uh, between 0 and 1. 
Okay, so uh, between a, a horizontal line like this and between a 45 degree line like this. So it, our line, uh, the lines that we will be drawing will be in this uh, octant. So if we uh, divide this two-dimensional space into eight regions, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, like this, okay, 45 degree angle, uh, our second endpoints will be somewhere here. And the x1, y1, x1 is always going to be uh, less than uh, x2 like this. Uh, if it's not like that, I mean, if x2 and y2 and x1, y1 has, have switched their roles, we can easily swap them to get our line segment into a situation which is x1 is to the left of x2, uh, and uh, y2 is larger than y1, uh, so that the slope is always like this. If it's not like that, for example, if we are want to draw a line whose slope is larger than 1, uh, one but we can swap the roles of x and y coordinates and use the same algorithm. Okay, so adapting the algorithm to these other cases where x value is uh, to the left, uh, it's, the adaptation is uh, trivial, so we are not going to uh, deal with these other situations directly. Uh, we are just going to, for sake of simplicity, we are going to assume that our slope is between 0 and 1, and uh, our two endpoints are given like this. So our goal will be, there are lots of bunch of pixels in this uh, area. For example, we are given this one and this one. As you can see, if the slope was one, we would we would just have the uh, pixels. If it was a, a slope of one, we would just go diagonal. Okay, assuming the pixels are square like this. Uh, our pixels are square, uh, by the way. That's that's there, there's no question. Uh, our pixels are always we are, we are dealing with square pixels. Uh, we are, we haven't talked about uh, we have different. Uh, our aspect ratio, x and y coordinates, the units are all unit length. Okay, so if the slope was one, exactly 1, drawing a line with a slope of exactly 1 is trivial. You just go diagonal like this. So when the slope is less than 1 like this, the thing that we will be doing, the algorithm that we are going to be doing is this. At every step of the algorithm, since the slope is less than 1, it means that our line is moving in such a way that its x-coordinate increases faster than its y-coordinate, right? I mean, this is what, it, what the slope uh, means intuitively. If you go to here, if y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1 is less than 1, it means that the difference between x's are larger than the difference between y's. So if you're going constant speed from this endpoint to this endpoint, you're just this is what a line is. It's something you go in unit time, you're going in constant speed. It means that your x coordinates, your your speed in x is faster than your speed in y. Okay? So therefore we are going to have an algorithm like this. At each iteration, we are going to go to the next pixel on the right for sure. Okay, so because x is always faster than uh, y, so at every iteration we are going to we are going to go right, one pixel right. We are not staying at the same uh, vertical level. At every iteration, we are going to draw something on the right. But we will make a decision. I mean, if you look at this line, at every step of the, at every next pixel, we move one pixel to the right. So our main for loop will be for x is equal to x0 to x1 and iterate one by one. So every time we are going to draw a pixel like this. But we are going to need to make a decision to decide, I mean, this decision will uh, help us to draw whether we're, we will be staying at the same level in the next iteration or we will be going up one level in the next iteration. Okay, so that will be our binary decision. At every iteration, we will be making a choice between, for example, if I'm currently in this pixel, in the next iteration, I have to make a decision whether I will be plotting this pixel 
or this pixel. The, I'm staying at the same level or I'm going one level up. When I'm here, I will again, if this is the current pixel, for the next pixel I'm making the same decision. Should I draw this one or this one? The, the decision as whether it's staying at the same level or going one level up is uh, a property of the fact that we're just looking at lines with slope between 0 and 1. Okay? I mean, if the slope was, for example, uh, between 1 and infinity, what we would do is we would increment y every iteration, y will be incremented one uh, pixel at every iteration. For example, imagine, let's think about a line starting point here, end point here. Okay, well, what, how will we draw, what's the best way to draw this line? Because y is already get going faster than x, the main algorithm is going to increment y at every uh, time step. By the way, I'm telling this as, as if it's a fact, but the, the thing is, why do we increment x1 or not by 2 or not by half? The thing is that we don't want, for example, we have some constraints in the line. We don't want gaps to occur in our lines. While you're drawing your line, you don't want uh, the line to appear as if there are holes in it. You're not trying to draw a dotted line. You want to draw a continuous line. You don't want your line to be too thick. You have your, you want your line to visually uh, represent this, the, the linear, the slope of the line. The slope of the line do, should not appear to change from place to place along the line. So uh, based on these constraints, just, just this is just a heuristic. It, it, it makes good sense that if your slope is between 0 and 1, you, your, since your x speed is faster than uh, your y speed is slower, let's go, let's fix the speed of x at unit speed, one pixel to the right at uh, this, uh, at one iteration, uh, and just, just check whether y has reached enough uh, distance so that it can move up one pixel. Uh, so there will be a pattern, for example, as you can see in this line, we have one go up, stay same, go up, stay same. Maybe it may continue like this based on slope. We may have different patterns too. For example, go up, stay same, go up, stay same, stay same, and then go up. Like three, two, three, two, three type of pattern. So there may be different patterns exist with respect to different slopes of lines, but we are not going to figure out those patterns uh, because there, there may be infinitely many of them because the slope between 0 and 1 is infinite. Uh, and depending on your resolution, the, there may be different number of uh, patterns that you have to deal with. But let's get back to the uh, previous question. If, if our slope is now between 1 and infinity, uh, one thing, we, the, we just modify the algorithm in such a way that we will increment y one step every iteration and we will this time decide whether x should, be, I mean, we, are, we will be deciding on whether we need to go to the north pixel or the northeast pixel. So we are going to name these pixels as if uh, uh, with some uh, north, east, west, uh, south directions. So this is, if this is the current pixel, this is the pixel to its immediate north, and this is the pixel to its northeast. So we will be making decisions between these two if uh, to, to move x to the right or right while y is always going up, if the slope is between 0 and 1, 1 and infinity. When the slope is between 0 and 1, we will make a decision between the pixel whether we have to go east or northeast. Okay, so you'll always go, e I mean, at each iteration, you're always going east. This is because x, x is going faster. But should we go north or remain at the same uh, height is what we are going to decide. Okay, so, and this decision, we'll be able to make it with integer operations we are going to see. Uh, one thing you could, for example, depending on slope, slope, I think uh, uh, an algorithm, let me just... Uh, describe an algorithm to you, uh, which is uh, how we would proceed. For example, imagine my slope is 0 0.28. Uh, 
Okay, imagine my slope is 0 0.28. So what I would do is, um, I mean, is, does this algorithm work? I would just maintain some number, some like let's call C, initialize C to M. And at every iteration, uh, I am going to increment C. For example, C is equal, I start with this. If uh, C is less than 1, uh, choose East. Else, uh, C is C minus 1.0 and choose Northeast. And at every iteration, I'm also incrementing C, C plus equals M. So it's like every time I'm going, so what does this M mean? M 0 0.28, what does it mean? It means that when X, when the increase in X, when delta X is one, your X in Y is 0 0.28 pixels. So the, the code that I have written here just says that if the increment in Y becomes one pixel length, I mean, if, if it becomes, if it's less than 1.0, it means that Y has not proceeded enough yet to go to the higher pixel maybe, okay? So only every time you're accumulating, so for example, in three iterations, or maybe in four iterations here, M is 0 0.28, uh, in, in, in the fourth iteration, since you're always accumulating M, M, at some point, M is going to pass 1.0, which means that, oh, y, now the Y coordinate has become large enough to jump to the next upper pixel. You, we, and that's where we do that. And now then we reset our Y value. Okay, you have jumped over 1.0, but this is what you have left. You have only 0 points, for example, 0, 2 left or so whatever it is. So we, we subtract one because we have we have jumped to the upper pixel. We subtract 1.0 from it and we continue doing this all the time. So we can actually uh, have an algorithm like this, which accumulate based and the slope value uh, the problem with this algorithm is that we are not going to be using this algorithm, but this algorithm would work. Uh, it will uh, work fine. Uh, it's using if the, the slope m is a floating point number. So uh, you would have to do floating point addition, uh, floating point checks, floating point subtraction. So it requires floating point operations. We are going to see an algorithm which is more efficient than the one, the accumulation of slope kind of algorithm that we have talked about. Okay. So uh, the main, yeah, the main uh, motivation here is we want to draw these lines fast, correctly, and we want as fast as possible. And also while we're drawing those, not only selecting the pixels, uh, we are going to also want to interpolate colors or other attributes like depth or a normal vector. Uh, color is just a vector, vector three, uh, a normal Vector is just also vec, vec3. We can interpolate along the primitives different things uh, like z value. The depth value is something that uh, reg, uh, that is one of the uh, interpolated th things along the primitives. So line rasterization. There are, I mean, in the in a couple of slides, there are different algorithms. Are also, for example, what we could do is we could just try to draw a box around centered at these pixels and with different thickness values this oriented box we're just going to check whether a uh, pixel center is inside the box or not if it's inside we can decide it so this is this is another algorithm which uses inclusion tests to draw a line but uh, the line thickness is not constant along the line depending on our um, boxes thickness we may have two thick uh, lines or uh, thin lines which we may have gaps in it so this algorithm is not good so I'm going to, I'm just going to skip these slides very fast okay because we're not going to be using this algorithm we are not going to draw a box around them and do inclusion uh, test we are going to implement an algorithm which is more similar to this uh, m accumulation 
So I'm skipping this one uh, because this box idea is not good. So we need another solution. Uh, we are going to use the line equation uh, to, to make this decision, which pixel belongs to the line. So uh, when we want to draw a line, so I, I named them x1, y1, and x2, y2, but yeah, in this slide it's x0, y0, uh, x1, y1. So there's a question. Uh, uh, let me quickly, before continuing, let me quickly answer that. While doing clipping, uh, yeah, when we do clip, uh, you're right. When we clip the, that's a very good point. So as you clip the lines and points, the new endpoint should get the color or depth attribute that is uh, that have to be attached to that new newly appointed endpoint. Otherwise, uh, we will be uh, we will assign. I mean, if you just assign the previous color value to the new endpoint, it will be incorrect. So uh, that's a that's a very good point. When we are doing clipping, uh, the the color interpolation for the uh, the clip the clip value has the t value, right? I mean, when we are doing clipping, uh, we are going to know the intersection point along the line where it is, and at that point for that new endpoint. Instead of inter, uh, just like interpolation, you can uh, find what will be the color or what will be the depth of that new clipped point, and you should definitely do that. That's uh, so this color attaching color values to the new clipped and I mean new found line segment endpoints is a very important thing to do. Otherwise, we would not, uh, yeah, if, uh, so your question is really a, a good question uh, because, yeah, if, uh, for example, if this is my image and if we have a line like this, if you know the color here, C1, you know the color here, C2, if I'm going to rasterize now a line between this pixel and this pixel, uh, I have to assign new color values, so C1 prime, just like I find this endpoint as a new point, the color should also be found uh, by this. But uh, as I said, you can find it by a weighted average. Uh, at that point, you can find this t value, the distance of this new endpoint to both of the endpoints of the line. So you can just uh, do something like this if distance is like, uh, if this distance, let's call this t, it's going to be like 1 minus t times c1 and if you're, you have parameterized your line in such a way that this is 1 and then uh, t times c2. So with this uh, you can find the new color value for this c1 prime. c1 prime could be found uh, by, by such a weighted average with respect to where you intersect the boundary. But yeah, that's a really, really important point. Uh, so, uh, yeah, in, in line rasterization, uh, we are going to uh, draw a line between these two coordinates, and we are going to assume the slope is between 0 and 1, and our goal will be to figure out which pixels to draw. And in our algorithm, we are going to use a different line equation. We are not going to use the parametric line equation or... Uh, the intercept slope equation, but there is another line equation we haven't talked about until now, uh, which is this uh, implicit line equation. Uh, uh, maybe you have you, you know this from high school or or other uh, mathematics courses, uh, and it's it we can drive this equation. The equation looks really complex with lots of uh, I mean, but lots of parts are constants. So these parts. This is constant, like some. So, I mean, if you just look at the line equation, actually, it has just this form. If x, y is equal to ax plus bx plus c. Okay, so uh, in uh, it's, it's, it, it resembles the plane equation a lot. It's only missing, if we had a plane equation, we would have a z, which will have the known equation ax plus bx plus cz plus d was our plane equation. If you just get rid of z, in 2D it becomes a line. Okay, so as you can see, this is a, 
this is b constant so ax plus by plus c and uh, how it's derived is it actually it's derived from every point any point uh, the fact that any point on the line if you form the vector from this point to some other known point on the line it could be p0 or it could be p1 uh, based on that you could have different uh, looking equations but uh, basically it's saying that if you form the vector from p to p0 or uh, from p0 to p the dot product of that with the normal of the line should be uh, zero uh, these they have to be perpendicular so only uh, points that uh, have for example if you have a point here if you form the vector from here if you do the same thing this is your normal vector the same normal vector if you look at the angle here it's larger than 90 degrees so if you do the dot product in this case uh, n times this p minus p0 is going to be less than zero right and if you if you have a point here which is not on the line if you again form the same vector p minus uh, p0 if you do the dot product between them in this case it's going to be greater than zero and only the points along the line will give me will satisfy this equation the normal vector p times p0 uh, is going to be the dot product between them is going to be zero and the dot product uh, can be found by I mean the, the normal vector uh, actually can be found by uh, solving either uh, this you can form the vector you already you know two points along the line p1 p1 is also on the line p1 minus p0 vector should when you, you dot product it with n it should give uh, the dot product of zero by the way there's some there's some mathematical notation error here uh, if I mean either we should also have a transpose here I mean if, if we indicate the points as 2 by 1 or, or 1 by 2 row vectors uh, I think I mean in order to have the dot product here they should be, this is not matrix multiplication this is dot product so I think they should have uh, I, I think we, we try, they try to in, indicate here in this slide uh, as as a matrix multiplication that's why we have this transpose but don't worry about it it's just the dot product of two vectors okay so the dot product of two vectors this is my one vector from x x0 y0 to x1 y1 uh, if you have if you already know this vector the other vector is just the inverse of the other I mean, you just invert the coordinates change the coordinates and take one of them minus okay so as you can see y1 minus y0 is uh, it's a negative y1 minus y0 is put here and x1 minus x0 is here that's your normal vector so your, so your line equation becomes any point with x y coordinates in order to be on the line uh, if we just form the vector to p0 that I as I just showed you if you multiply it with the normal vector it should give us zero and if you uh, open this equation up you'll end up with this one okay it looks uh, complicated but it has the same ax plus b y plus c form okay so that's our implicit line equation one thing that this equation gives us I and mean, if it is asking question here is that when it's on the line it gives us zero but it also gives us some for example if it's below the line we see that it's less than zero if it's above the line this equation gives us greater than zero so it allows us to distinguish points above the line and below the line and we are going to be using this as our decision variable actually so what are we going to decide let's quickly before the break let me quickly uh, talk about uh, that so here are basic algorithm is for lines between slopes between 0 and 1 okay we'll have to do some modifications for lines that are that have different slopes or that have different orders between their endpoints so we will start with x0 y0 initialize y to y0 and this is our main loop our main iteration we will start from x0 
go to x1 increment one by one at each iteration the first as you can see the first thing that is drawn the first drawn pixel at this point is x is equal to x0 y is equal to y0 so draw the pixel x0 y0 first that's your beginning point of your line now only if some condition occurs you increment y otherwise you don't increment y so that's the basic algorithm but what's that condition this is the condition that we will be doing so it's, it's, a, it's a really smart algorithm actually I mean we, 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 were, we were to decide between east and northeast right look at this midpoint between these two pixels okay if I put this midpoint into my implicit line equation okay so this is let me turn on the annotate again let's call this midpoint uh, mid okay so if I put this midpoints xy coordinate if into my implicit line equation it's going to be greater than zero in this case right because it's above the line what what happens for example when it's above the line what does it mean if the midpoint is above the line it means that the pixel this east pixel the lower pixel is actually passing closer to the line right I mean if my line passed exactly through the middle both pixels will be equal equidistant to the line if the line is passing lower than the midpoint which means that midpoint is above the line it means that uh, the line is actually passing closer at this at this x coordinate by the way we are doing that at this x coordinate whatever this x coordinate is at this x coordinate the line is if the midpoint is above the line it's passing closer to the lower pixel so this is exactly what we're going to do only if so and this is the coordinate uh, look at this function I'm currently at this x y x plus 1 is this this one if this is x if this coordinate is x this is x plus 1 and this is exactly the midpoints y coordinate is always y plus whatever the y coordinate is y plus 0 0.5 is our midpoints y coordinate so this is the midpoints coordinates if it's less than zero it means that it's below the line I mean if it's less than zero it will be our line if it our line is like this midpoint is going to be below the line which means that our line is passing closer to the pixel to the northeast only then we increment y is equal to y plus one okay so the algorithm is basically this but you now you may argue that we still have floating point operations here and we have to evaluate a complicated implicit line equation at every iteration this doesn't make sense I mean this is even worse this, uh, I mean it's less efficient than the previous slope accumulating algorithm uh, but we are going to see we can we can improve this algorithm we can optimize it in such a way that we are going to use something in graphics there's something called coherence coherence uh, is the property that neighborhood neighboring things for example if you have if you have, if you're drawing something some some pixels and there are lots of pixels that are uh, neighboring to each other something that you have computed here is not totally independent from what you will be computing from the next pixel so there is smoothness in our images so coherence means that what you compute here uh, the next one coherently follows some 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 previous value okay actually we didn't make use of this coherence property in ray tracing at all right in ray tracing we assumed all the rays were independent from each other and we didn't make use of this to make our rays uh, tracing more efficient but this is something what we observe in real life I mean in real life the real images are coherent uh, when you're uh, seeing I mean there are, of course there are boundaries okay there are boundaries in which things abruptly change but for certain regions of uh, pixels 
uh, so things are coherent. If you're looking at the surface, if you're looking at a wall, the pixels along the wall do not immediately change. They are similar to each other. I mean, here, when we're drawing a line, there is also something coherent going on. For example, we have the, the line slope is constant. We have a constant increase, constant speed. So we are going to make use of that. And the thing is, for example, uh, here is the, the thing. Uh, if you know the value, the previous value of fx is given to you, or the previous value of the, of the previous mid, midpoint, by using this, can you find out what uh, the next value is going to be by using the previous value? Instead of computing this from scratch, instead of computing, evaluating this line function from scratch every time, can we write this fx1 with respect to the previous values? The, the thing that changes is that based on our previous value decision, for example, if our previous decision is this, then the midpoint is going to be this in the next step, right? And if the previous decision was this, then the midpoint is going to be this. So the midpoint, the, the following, the next midpoint, which one is going to be mid? Is this going to be the midpoint or is this going to be the midpoint? We don't know actually before our previous decision. So this 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 depends on what our decision was and we are going to exactly uh, do that in a couple of slides so so here yeah this midpoint one the m1 and m2 we don't know what whether which one is going to be uh, the new uh, midpoint but as you can see m0 is here the the midpoint after xy when we choose e as you can see it's closer the line is passing closer to the lower one M1 will be the midpoint. Uh, so if we selected E in the next iteration, we need the value of Fm1 for the next iteration in order to make decision. If we selected the northeast, uh, we will need Fm2. That will be our midpoint. But the interesting thing is that both of them can be computed by just using uh, Fm0. If you know fm0, if, if you know the current uh, function value fm0, uh, we, we haven't done the decision yet. So it's going to be equal to fm. The difference between, if you just plug in the values of, uh, because we know that the difference between them in terms of x coordinate, I mean, these, these, the things that you see on the right here are directly found out by uh, for example, what is M1? If you know the, for example, I, I actually know M0's coordinates. Let me again write that quickly. Uh, yeah, so M0 is x plus 1, y plus 0 0.5, right? This is M0's coordinates. If this is xy, M0 is x plus 1, y plus 0 0.5. And in that case, m1 is equal to, I mean its coordinate is equal to x plus 2 uh, plus y plus 0 0.5. m1 is, because m1 is at exactly the same level as m0, so it's 0 0.5 here. And m2 has the same x coordinate, x plus 2, uh, but it's going to be equal to y plus 1.5. So I, I know the coordinates of all these things. If you just plug it in your line equation and take these differences, you can, it's just some addition, multiplication, and subtraction, you're going to see that. The difference between the implicit line equation between these two, m1 and m0, is equal to a constant value. That's, that's remarkable, okay? This is just some constant that you should compute once. And we will uh, we will be using this as our uh, I mean we can use this value if you don't need to recompute fm1 if you if you already know some initial value all you need to do is add y0 minus y1 to that but if your decision is this one so actually what we will do is based on we'll we'll have an if condition if fm0 is less than zero, right? 
sorry, if it's greater than zero, uh, here in this case it's, it's, it's greater. If it's greater than zero, fm1, instead of computing it, we will just say that fm1 is equal to fm0 plus the c, if it's greater than zero. Else, all I'm going to do is, else is this, uh, if it's else, else fm2, or my decision variable, actually, uh, I, uh, my decision variable will not know whether it's, it's always the mid next midpoint for us, uh, will be fm0 plus this constant. This is another constant, as you can see. The previous constant is also added another x1 minus x0 here. Okay, so we're just going to take, and these are, by the way, both this constants and this, this constant, they are integers, as you can see, because y0, y1, x1, x0, they're all integer coordinates. So, depending on the value of f0, uh, I can find what it will be next. So here is how it's implemented, but we are not done, done yet in terms of efficiency. I'm, after that, I'm going to quickly uh, uh, go to go to break. So yeah, uh, fm zero uh, is so it. This is the uh, incremental thing, the coherence property that we are going to be used. If we know what fm is, we can compute the next f function for the midpoint by simple integer arithmetic. This is what these increments are telling us. Uh, so f x0 y0 is equal to 0. The initial value of this one is 0. I know that because it's on the line. That is the starting point of the line. And the first midpoint, which is this. So if we start our equation, I mean, the line drawing starts with x0 y0. The first midpoint is always this. Okay, so this is the first midpoint, x0 plus 1, uh, y0 plus 0 0.5, we, when we start our uh, equation here. And when you plug it into your line equation, it gives you y0 minus y1 plus 0 0.5 x1 minus x0. Now, we still have a small problem here. We couldn't completely get rid of the floating point numbers. But here's the thing. How do we use this f function when we are doing our decisions? We're just using its sign, right? We just say, is this less than zero? Is this greater than zero? Uh, if, if you're just using the sign of this f function, instead of using f, what if I use 2f? If I multiply this f by 2, would it change its sign? whatever the original f value is. No, that's the small intelligent tri trick that we are going to implement to turn this into a complete set integer problem. Instead of looking at f directly like this, if I'm looking at 2f, this will be 2 times y minus y1 and x1 minus x0. And that's exactly what we do. So, so here it is. This is the final algorithm. The algorithm is actually, as you can see, very simple. So this is the initial uh, initial m value. Let's call this d, d. We are going to accumulate this d, and this is nothing but two times f m zero. Okay. So originally it was like this. If I multiply it by two, nothing changes in terms of my. I mean these. The, the sign of D is not going to matter, okay? And when we're accumulating uh, this, we also accumulate by two times this and two times don't. We, we, we have to do the accumulations also, right? But the, this is the entire algorithm. As you can see, it's very simple. You start with y0, x0. You have some f function, which is evaluated first. So this is the first time we do integer multiplication. Actually, you don't need to do integer multiplication. This is multiplication by 2. So you can do bitwise shift, uh, left shift, whatever this integer value is, and then integer addition. And the, the, the remaining part also, I mean, these multiplication by 2, you can use bitwise left shift operator to make it more efficient. It's just integer. Oh, by the way, you can actually pre-compute these. You don't need to, I mean, you don't need to compute all these at every iteration. This can be pre-computed here, which is the same thing here, right? I mean, you can say that, for example, the initial D. 
d is going to be incremented the same as the no it's not the same as initial d sorry about that uh, it's not the multiplication by 2 applies to both of them but it can still be pre-computed before going into the for loop once and this one too these are constants you have just two constants that you can do uh, outside the for loop the entire algorithm is just increment y if it's uh, d is less than 0 so uh, so if d is less than 0 we increment y and what do you think if we're always incrementing d how can it change signs how can it go positive and then negative positive and negative how, how, how does it how does how does it work uh, for example so let, let's see what we're doing here there's some initial value of d um, this initial value of d actually uh, depending on I think the if the slope is between 0 and 5 0 and 0 0.5 and 0 0.5 and 1 we will have uh, either a positive or a negative initial starting d but what happens is that this is a negative number right I mean y1 is larger than y0 because I mean we are drawing x0 y0 is the bottom uh, left point x1 y1 is the, the top right point so this is a negative number a negative uh, number multiplied by 2 and a positive number so if the slope was less than 0 0.5 d would be positive okay so which means that we will if the slope is less than 0 0.5 in the first iteration we will remain at the same level in the next pixel which makes sense if the slope is larger than 0 0.5 between 0 0.5 and 1 uh, which which means that multiplying this by 2 uh, this negative uh, number uh, will give me a negative d initially so this is exactly what happens I mean every time if we go up we are going to be so this is this is for sure a positive number look at this since the slope is less than 1 x1 minus x0 should be larger than y0 minus y1 I mean y1 minus y0 but this is the negative one uh, if the slope is between 0 and 1 this is always a positive number so we keep uh, and this is always a negative number so it's like when you go up you add some positive number to your accumulator and every time you stay at the same level you're decrementing small uh, you, you're decrementing your d value as soon as it goes below zero it, in this decrements eventually at some point it's going to get below zero then that's the point you go up and you increment it in such a way that now it becomes some positive value which will be started uh, which we will start decrementing again in the subsequent iterations okay so intuitively you may understand the algorithm like this and uh, you may try it on some example values to see how it works how uh, there is a certain pattern of uh, accumulation and uh, decrementing of this value how it goes below zero then increments to some number and how it, this pattern relates to the slope of your line uh, is uh, something you can experiment if you want but the algorithm is this simple and for the assignment all you need to do is implement this in some kind of a, a C code I mean it's all almost C, almost C code here uh, to do that the only remaining thing is how we are going to do the interpolation along the line okay uh, and that's uh, and also for adaptation to other slopes minor modifications as I said previously uh, are needed uh, for instance if the uh, slope is between M and infinity we need to swap the rules of X and Y also for uh, infinite slope I mean for vertical lines you may you don't need to have a line drawing algorithm you may treat such lines separately or also for horizontal lines for horizontal lines y is never incremented you always increment x so you may have horizontal and vertical lines could be drawn simply uh, without applying the algorithm uh, for other cases you can either swap the rules of beginning and end points or x and y coordinates to execute the same uh, algorithm 
And you may think that uh, floating point operations on the new CPUs are much more efficient. Uh, uh, and it's not like the difference between float versus integer is not like it used to be in 1970s. Uh, by then, in 1967, so this, this algorithm was originally developed in 1967, the algorithm we just discussed, uh, which was floating point arithmetic was very expensive, and that, that's why they tried really hard to do everything with just uh, integer operations. Uh, does this difference between float and integer, does it still matter? Uh, Ozoj actually implemented uh, this, uh, and he uh, drew 1 million lines between 1,000 and 1,400 pixels long each, uh, tested his code on uh, this machine, uh, a high-end CPU. Uh, the basic algorithm which doesn't use this integer operations, which has some floating point operations, took 7.2 seconds. The optimized algorithms, 3 seconds. So it still matters. If you want twice as faster line drawing, you should use the integer uh, version. Okay, so I think it's a, now a good time to have a, a break, but let me first uh, answer uh, Said's question. So in viewport uh, transformation, uh, yeah, if you for transformation, the endpoints at the end uh, are the endpoints are integer coordinates, center of the pixels directly. So we just do rounding to find the nearest pixel, just like the nearest pixel in texture mapping. Uh, let me quickly figure out where we did that uh, report. So I think it's at the end of this one. Maybe it's just it was just a small note at the end, maybe. Uh, but yeah, this is what we do. So Z fighting, I think it should be before Z. Yeah, viewport transformation. The final viewport. So this is the transformation. It's still after that. Uh, doesn't. No, it's still uh, floating point values, but we round it to the nearest integer at the end. I think we haven't mentioned that here. So yeah, the viewport coordinates are still floating value here. As you can see, they're still, uh, they may be still floating because our perspective, uh, these matrix multiplication does not turn them to integers. Uh, after we find these XVP, y, YVP, and ZVP, we round them. Uh, not, not Z, but we round X and Y uh, to the nearest integers uh, to, to find the pixels. Yeah, this is, uh, this is not, yeah, uh, it's not actually mentioned here. Good, thank you for reminding that. It's actually, we are going to round it in, uh, at the end and we are going to start with center of pixels coordinates directly. Yeah. The, that's why we have, you're right, that's why in the midpoint algorithm we just deal with integers. X0, Y0 here, uh, we'll be using the, after the viewport transformation, the final values, viewport coordinates, are rounded to the nearest integer coordinates, which are the center of the pixels. Thanks for this reminder. So we will meet at uh, like a 7 minute uh, break, 10.55, uh, okay, in 7 minutes we will continue with how we can do interpolations and then finally triangle rasterization. See you in seven minutes. I will stop recording.